Yes, welcome to the No State Project here on my YouTube channel, No State Project, and uh, live episode 81, yeah, 81 already episodes of the big show commercial free right here on my YouTube channel. And uh, there we go, there we go. A, little a little behind the scenes there you can see. Uh, uh, glad to be with you, got a lot of stuff to get to, some really good news too, I do have a Success story, but I don't have any real details, so I'm still waiting on the documentation for that. But uh, misdemeanor charge and uh, the prosecution at the day, of, I believe it was the day of trial, uh, decided to withdraw, which was really nice. Again, I don't have all the details. Uh, when I have that, I will post that. I want to thank everyone for their support of the show. It is needed, really. Uh, do uh, So I do appreciate some of the support. Well, with the support we do get for the show, uh, if you're able to support the show, uh, it's appreciated. Go to markstevens.net and help out. Uh, this Friday show, well, we're going to have the role playing tomorrow at this time. Uh, not a typical broadcast, uh, because this is for court procedure or anything regarding anarchy, uh, or, or that you want to discuss. And, uh, uh, tomorrow is just a role playing. It's just court procedure. But I will not be live. This is going to happen for a while, where every other week I will not be live on Saturday for the LRN broadcast. But it's going to be new material most of the time. And it will be this weekend, but we're going to have to pre-record that right here on YouTube on Friday uh, to the 4th. So write that down. 2 to 4. That's 2 hours of Anarchy Radio right here on my YouTube channel, which will then be broadcast in my usual slot on the LRN broadcast. So we're all new. So whatever we miss today, uh, two hours commercial. Yeah, two hours commercial free. So we won't have any interruptions there for those, for those days there. Now, uh, I, I don't know. I was just one of those moods. Uh, it, it, but it, it seems to be kind of a, uh, something I noticed, and I'm not gonna, I may or may not do a social experiment based on it, but if you post something on Facebook, like to basically an anarchist type audience, and you are anti-veganism, you just want to piss all over vegans, uh, you will get, people will pig pile with you on vegans. The hate is palpable. And, um, I had someone pull the God card and say that God said it was okay for him to eat animals because well, before the flood it was not okay, but then God changed his mind that now it's okay to eat animals. And so he said that his ethics were based on God saying that it was ethical to kill wantonly, to kill with no, just to kill because God said it was okay. And, and at that point you, you, you have you have no rational discussion. You're not, you know, I don't necessarily agree with you can't use reason to reason somebody out of a position he didn't reason himself into. That's not necessarily true. I think it's broadly true, but not always true. But when someone pulls the God card, they're telling you rational discussion and any chance of having an actual intellectual or philosophical type of, you know, argument with me, gone. Gone. Pulling the God card. God told me. So if Odin told me it's okay to kill people and eat them, you know, according to this guy, I that's okay because all moral, all moral or ethical uh, 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 principles are equal. So Odin told me it's okay to kill and eat human beings. Okay, don't force you. Hey, hey. Don't force your ethics on me. I mean, that's it's such a, a, a stupid cop out. Don't force, no one's forcing you. We're discussing principles. You know, we can discuss the principle of anarchy. We can discuss principles of socialism or principles of statism. If, if I'm on the show discussing principles of statism, that is okay to lie, steal, kill, and cheat people if, if you're a government. You're not just an ordinary man or woman here, no. You're a government. People are going to turn around and say, don't force your statism on. I'm not doing that. We're discussing the principle. Just like the crap storm that happened last week. You just, you know, and, and, uh, 
Yeah. It's going to happen today. I think if we're going to be taken seriously, instead of just, and here's someone who gets way too much attention. The biggest world. I the best words. I got a, I got one of the best minds. Of, everything with Trump is the best ever. It's like talking to a seven year old. This is the best painting I've ever done. This is the best. Everything is the best. And everybody initially around him until they get fired are the best. That this Kavanaugh who lied through his teeth, which is all we need to know is to, to, about Brett Kavanaugh, what kind of person he is. Look at what he said under oath for those few days. You don't have to go anywhere beyond that to realize what a lying weasel the guy is. But he has the potential to be the greatest Supreme Court justice in history. But so we want to be taken seriously, and not just by people who who are led by the nose by a, a, a blathering narcissist. So we have to have precise, logical, coherent arguments for our position. Why do I argue for anarchy? Because, oh, okay, uh, let's see, why shouldn't we have a ruling class? Oh, yeah, there's so many things we can uh, We don't have to have a prison system where over, you know, uh, where people who haven't hurt anybody are in. Is that, that, we don't have to be bombing in our name innocent people in the Middle East? Is that, uh, you know, wars? So I can give you, you know, it, it's because it, they're harmful. They don't, it, and, and that the means conflicts with their end. So government, at least in the United States, is supposed to be to protect life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But they have to violate that in order to do, you know, to, 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 to stay, you know, to be a ruling class and stay in power. So there's my, my logical, coherent, you know, rational arguments why we shouldn't have a ruling class. Because it, because the means, of, you know, conflicts with the end. And the end is what we're interested in. Anarchy is more consistent with that end of protecting life, liberty, and property, and life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. But you, 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 when you get on Facebook or, or, you know, you, you just see these ridiculous things where people conflate self-proclaimed anarchists. And so one of the things that, ha so the vegan thing is just insane, that the amount of hate and the mental gymnastics. What it comes down to, it's an ethical principle of choice. So you bring up, if you have a choice in eating, you having just plants, which is proven to be uh, you know, doable and gives you the lowest risk of all cause mortality. You have a choice. If you have that choice and you still choose to cause, uh, death and destruction to animals, that is unethical. That's not me forcing my ethics on somebody. I mean, you could turn around, you could say, Oh my gosh, Jeffrey Dahmer is such a horrible person for killing people. What? But you're, is that you forcing your morals on Jeffrey Dahmer? No, you're making a state, you're making an ethical judgment. Not forcing anybody, but that's what you get. Why are you forcing your morals on me? Holy, like again, we're just trying to have a rational discussion on ethical principles. There's no need. So what they'll do? But what about this? What about people who can't? We've already established the ethical principle. If they don't have a choice, then it may not be unethical. But they keep veering around the ethical principle. It's just like the ethical principle of do no harm applied to anarchy. It makes perfect sense. All it is is an extension of that. So one of the things that I did see today, and again, there's there's no ire, there's no anger. I just I was pointing something out. I I think if, if we're going to make sloppy arguments, we as anarchists uh, or voluntarists, we will lose credibility. So I think we need to be very very cautious because look. People will pull out what you've said before and say, ha, ha, ha. So one of the things that I saw was somebody was what looked to me to be the typical conflating of capitalism as an economic system with the free market. And that they think that it's one and the same. And I had come out and I said, no, no, no. Capitalism is, in simple terms, is nothing really too much more, well, it really, the, the defining principle of it, or it separates it from other economic systems, is the private ownership of the means of production. That is, the other things all come from that. Because all the, most, a lot of the other aspects of capitalism, you can still have in a totalitarian, fascist, or socialist, communist type state. Ah. Oh. 
so uh, so I wanted I read the last time the definition of socialism. So let's just look at the definitions, and I'm not going to go through and, and give the citations. This is on Wikipedia. Let's look at the actual definition of capitalism. And I do want to point out that any time you look at an, apod- an academic definition of, so- uh, of capitalism, when they use the word free market, they are not using it in the same sense as a voluntarist, an agorist, or an anarchist would use it. They're talking about a regulated government system. Okay, So keep that in mind. Capitalism is an economic system based on private ownership of the means of production and their operation for profit. Characteristics central to capitalism include private property, uh, capital accumulation, wage labor, uh, voluntary exchange, a price system, and competitive markets. In a capitalist market economy, decision-making and investment are determined by every owner of wealth, property, or production ability in financial and capital markets, whereas prices and the distribution of goods and services are mainly determined by competition of goods and services market. Uh, So we skip down. Well, they talk about certain types of capitalism. You have the laissez-faire capitalism, which is more of a, lib- a classic liberal, uh, where uh, it's a, a minimal uh, number of regulations. I know no regulations. Laissez-faire includes government, as far as I remember. Um, so the laissez-faire capitalism, or free market capitalism, welfare capitalism, and state capitalism. Different forms of capitalism that feature varying degrees of free markets, uh, public ownership, obstacles to free competition, and state-sanctioned social policy. The uh, degree of competition in markets, the role of intervention and regulation, and the scope of state ownership vary across different models of social uh, capitalism. The extent to which different markets are free, as well as the rules defining property, private property, are matters of politics and policy. Most existing capitalist economic economies are mixed economies, which combined elements of free markets with state intervention and, in some cases, economic planning. I still believe that what by free market, because if you're talking about a black market, yeah, that's that's different where there's no regulation or taxation. But uh, regular, what they're referring to as free markets, uh, as long as there's regulations and taxes and whatnot, and licenses, not technically a free market. So what I'm getting at is. Capitalism is not synonymous with free market. You can take uh, some of these aspects and you can have a socialist community where you do have commun- communal ownership of the, uh, of the means of production and you still have capital investment and, and you can have a free market where there's no government. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it, I just want to make clear that we our arguments need to be better and we need to not conflate and have crappy arguments. Uh, someone's going to screen cap what you've wrote and they'll throw it up in your face. Uh, or they'll just, uh, no, they could just straw man it, but you know. Uh, where you to that? And if you're on Facebook, you are gonna see straw man like you would not believe. But I have some good news before I get to my calls here. So, uh, I mentioned that this, this is good. This is good. This is a United States first. Potentially, I haven't, I haven't looked into this, but I think the authors are right. The main man cleared of sexually assaulting his wife has reached a three hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars settlement in his lawsuit against uh, a lawsuit against more than a dozen defendants. And who are these defendants? Oh, I thought you were one of them. That's good. Uh, Goldsboro resident Vladik Filler sued the county police and prosecutors. This is up in Maine. They don't live there anymore, but uh, his lawyer tells WABI-TV that this is the first case in Maine. Or maybe Maine. I don't know if this has ever happened before outside of Maine. I I doubt it. First case in Maine where state prosecutors have paid to settle a lawsuit involving prosecutorial misconduct. (laughs) Wait till you find out who it is again. Filler, who now lives in Georgia, was convicted of assault for clear to rape charges made during a divorce and child custody battle. Eventually, the assault charge was dismissed. His 2015 civil lawsuit contended he was denied a fair trial. A judge ruled that evidence, this was a federal judge, a federal lawsuit. There's a lot missing from this argument. A judge ruled that evidence was left out and that the prosecutor made improper statements. The prosecutor was later sanctioned. Who is that 
prosecutor, you ask? Because they didn't put it in the article. And I have to thank my friend uh, Nelson up there in Maine. Thank you for this. The prosecutor's name, Mary Kelly. Yeah. Yeah. She was finally held to some account for her serial misconduct. This is a woman who does it, who has done it many times, multiple times. It's a regular part of how she does prosecutions. Mary Kelly. Nice. So I'll put the links in the show notes and I'm going to put them now into the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, YouTube chat so you can check the article out for yourself because the article has a video that has video of Mary in it. And, uh, uh, Kellett eventually admitted she violated rules of the main bar and was disciplined. Now, I'm pretty, I, I don't know what the discipline was. I'm sure it went like this. Now, you got caught. Don't, don't get caught again. Because then we might have to do something. $375,000. I had filed a complaint against her. With the main bar, they didn't They knew the bar association. They knew, and in and, and that prosecutor's office, they knew all about her, and they let it go. You know why? Another, another argument in favor of more evidence in favor of anarchy, not having a ruling class. Because as a ruling class, they have a different set of rules, and people like Mary Kelly can destroy lives. She a- admitted to withholding exculpatory evidence that showed he was not guilty of rape. That's what you get from these lawyers. That's what you get from a ruling class where the rules of go no harm do not apply to them. When you allow people to act as if they have a moral right to be immoral, how could you not expect people like Mary Kelly up there in Hancock County, I think it's Hancock County. It's definitely there. Yeah, that's what we're talking about here. Yeah. So again, if we're gonna make arguments, let's be precise. A little bit of fact checking. Make sure the argument is sound. This way, the only thing you can get in response are straw man's and logical fallacies, where they can accuse, where they or just say, well, uh, uh. I don't need any evidence to support my claims. But you need evidence to disprove them. That's the kind of crap that you get from status. So it's really disheartening to see a self-proclaimed anarchist using the same defenses, using the same arguments in form, different content, but the same form to defend their crap. Let's be better than that. Let's use better arguments. Let's use evidence. Let's use logic. Let's be better. Our position is is morally yeah yes it is morally superior. Just like we are morally superior than those in Saudi Arabia who kill people for being homosexuals. So yes, I and anyone who believes uh, the same as I do, we are morally superior to people who are immoral and unethical, killing people because they're homosexuals. That is morally inferior. That's morally reprehensible. That is criminal. And to say, so, so I, I don't get this. It's okay to say that murder is bad. It's okay to point out that rape is bad. It's okay to point out that stealing is bad. It's okay to point out that lying is bad. But it's not okay somehow. And all of a sudden now you're triggering somebody and trying to force your ethics on them when you say killing an animal. When you have <laughs> that, oh, that, oh, oh, don't pour it. Consistency in your argument and your ethics. So let's see what we can do. We'll get to Kevin in Pittsburgh. Kevin, welcome back to the show. Hi, Mark. How you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing today? Um, I was found guilty in appeals court on a traffic violation, and you sent me a motion for post-conviction relief. And then uh, I went down to clerk of courts, and they told me I had to fill out paperwork to give to the appeals court. 
and then go to the Superior Court and file paperwork and get a copy of the transcript. Now, do I do all those things along with your motion for post-conviction relief? Or? Well, let's see if I understand you. You were found guilty okay. in the appellate court, not the trial court? Uh, well, it's Pennsylvania, so I went in front of the local magistrate, and then it goes right to the appeals court. It's a trial de novo at the appeals court. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. I, just, I had a clarify. And then now I... Okay. Yes, you would be filing, since they are the new trial court, you would be filing your appeal and uh, your petition for post-conviction relief into that court, since it's not... Since when they tried you de novo, they weren't sitting over the appellate court. Okay, it seems like they're asking all that stuff in the uh, paperwork, so I don't know if I filed the motion also along with uh, all the paperwork they want me to file. Well, what's, run down again the paperwork that they want you to file. Um, the appeals court, the, the, the county clerk of court that I got to file uh, some paperwork with them, which is um, $80, and then... I do that, and then I got to go over to the Superior Court and you know fill out paperwork there, which costs ninety dollars. All right, and then I got to go and get a copy of the transcript to take to the Superior Court. Which is the court you tried in, Genova? Uh, the Appeals Court downtown, the County Appeals Court. And was that from the? Did you have? Did you appeal that from the Superior Court? No, no, I appeal that just from the local magistrate up the street. So like, okay, so how does the superior court, are they, uh, uh, is the, so do you have the appellate court and then you, is your appeal going to the superior court? I guess, that's what they told me. I had just asked them how do I, uh, appeal, uh, wow. my guilty verdict at the appeals court. Well, as far as I understand, I've done, I helped with a lot of appeals. You, you file everything with the trial court. The notice of appeal is with the trial court, and the uh, the petition for post-conviction relief is also with the trial court. Now, there may be a fee for that, and there's nothing we can do except maybe trying to get it um, waived or have it deferred. Why you would have to file something into the Superior Court may be a particular rule in, in Pennsylvania that I'd have to verify. I'd have to look that up and verify it. It doesn't seem right. And getting a copy of the transcript, yeah, there's not much you and I can do about that. They're going to stick you for that. Oh, okay. But the $90... I have one other thing. thing. Oh, okay, go ahead. I was just going to say, the $90 to the Superior Court, that doesn't sound right. Definitely get into the rules and verify that that's true before paying anything. Okay. And then um, the local electric company, I've been refusing to get the, uh, the new smart meter that we put in like a couple years ago, and now... They've been sending me letters saying I got to switch over, the time's up, and I got a letter here like last week saying today was my last day or they're going to shut off. I could face service termination. Is there anything I can do about resisting to get the smart meter? Why don't you want the smart meter? Because they're, uh, they're just transmitting radiation and stuff, and they're toxic. Well, and they're spying on us. Well, they're, gonna, they're, they're spying on you in other ways. I mean, they don't need the smart meter to spy on. They, 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 oh they, yeah, I know, <laughs> but they're still using them too. Is is that provable? Is is, is there evidence? I don't know. I, I'm just throwing out. You know, can, you know, is there? Can we look at this online and prove that that you know that the smart meters are spying on you? Well, they sent us letters saying you can go online and read everything, and that they're all in connection with each other, and then they like report back. They said they like communicate with each other. But uh, I mean, the radiation is true. I mean, there's Harvard scientists and stuff all day, and you know that the radiation coming off the smart meters. And they and they can show basically. that, and they can show that that is harmful to someone inside the house. I think so. Yeah. Well, I, I know that our friend Jan up in British Columbia has fought those and, and is not. I don't know anybody who's done it su successfully. I don't, you know, it's very difficult to argue an issue of jurisdiction there because you don't want them to disconnect you from the, from the grid, which I doubt they, they would do. Uh, it, this one seems like it's, it's not one we're gonna, we're gonna win. You know, I, I don't know how long some other people were out. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not something that I've ever delved into, uh, personally. So I have no, 
I, I have no basis in, in what would happen if you did challenge it, other than to look at what happened in British Columbia. They could just turn off your electric and your screen. Now, if you have, yeah. if you, if you're in Phoenix, a place like that where you can have, uh, 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 solar and you don't need to be connected to the grid, then, to the grid, then you can just say, I'm a phone goal, I don't care. Disconnect the tough guy, I don't care. It seems to, you know, I, so I don't know. I, I don't know if, if that's, uh, a fight that you can win because you're, they're just cutting your, it's like not paying the water. I just, they're, they're just going to cut that. Uh, yeah, I wasn't refusing to pay the bill. I just was refusing to let them <laughs> put a new meter. And I actually welded my old one in there, so I don't know how they're going to get in there anyways now. Uh, they may cut your power if you don't let them in. Yeah, well, I thought they were going to come anyway, so they're just going around not even asking permission. But, yeah, I mean, there's all a bunch of trees and stuff. They just passed me up because of all the weeds and the debris. Yeah, but, uh, I, I, I guess they've been if, sending me letters like the past few years. I, yeah, I, I guess, uh, you know, you could challenge it. Just say, look, I'm not going to stop paying, but I, I don't want this. And, and uh, I, I, it, it, it's harmful. And, and if you can prevent, prevent credible evidence that it is harmful, then maybe that would be enough to keep them from doing that. I mean, it would suck to have to go to court, but if you've got solid evidence that these things are harmful, uh, you may be able to get an injunction against them to prevent them from uh, doing it. Uh, yeah, I'll see if I want to go that far. But yeah, some states have, have an off-dot policy, but uh, yeah, mine doesn't. Yeah, that sucks. And I'm in Phoenix. I wish I had the money. I would go straight solar and not not even worry about a meter. But um, yeah, I'm not in a position to do that right now. <laughs> I need... The, the show needs support, so it's not something I'm going to do. So I wish I had more to offer you there, but let me know uh, what your research shows as far as the filing something with the appellate court at this time. Uh, as far as I know, everything is filed with the trial court and then transfers everything up to the uh, appellate court. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll research more of that. All right. I appreciate, thanks a lot. I appreciate the call. Kevin in Pittsburgh. We've got another new caller here. And uh, if you want to join me on the show, it's 218-632-9399, 218-632-9399. Someone is saying here, Emily, saying you can win the smart meter fight. Uh, she's kept them off there and that they uh, there are legal documents online you can use. Jerry Day has some good ones. I'd be, okay, everything, again, you got to look at it as a skeptic with everything. So everything. But, well, yes, yeah, Stahl, I was saying solar because I'm in Phoenix. We have... You know, you know, eleven and a half months of sunlight here, so you know, we, gotta, we can get away with it over here. Hey, good. Well, I never thought I'd see the day after growing up on Long Island and living half my life on Long Island, and I would, I would love to just sit and you know and watch the rain. But I do. All right. Uh, again, I, uh, new caller. I believe it's, uh, San Diego, but, uh, area code 619. You're live on the No State Project. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Uh, this is Michael. Calling from San Diego. All right. Michael, what do you have for us today? Well, um, in regard to the previous conversation we just had, I personally suffer from, um, what do they call it? I'm hypersensitive to Wi-Fi. And it took me uh, for eight years now. It started out as a small like, buzz feeling on the top of my scalp. And it slowly got worse. And I thought I had something to do with meditation. I was way off. Because every time I left my building on visit, it went away. And every time I came home, I sat down in my chair. It was super, super strong. It was just two weeks ago I decided I'm going to shut my Wi-Fi off. And in the moment I shut it off, the sensation that I feel was um, lowered from 100% to about 40 or 50%. And then when I plugged it back in, bam, it, my head lights up again. You know, that's the, wow. the sensation I get. So I believe in... I'm surrounded by 12 port meters plus it's Wi-Fi with it 
within my building. So I, I personally believe that there is some health effect in that regard. That wasn't the purpose of my call. Um, I do believe because of this, it kind of affects my study. Um, I've been following you for six years. Wow. And paying attention to your, all your videos and listening to your, um, your show. Um, I downloaded some of your documents because I had no reason to have one to have them on hand. And once you know what, a month later, I just pulled over for, um, turning on a, um, a sign, uh, it was marked, no turning between the valves. And the moment I made that turn, there was already a line of sheriff pulling people over. Ah. They were doing exactly what I was doing. And so I got pulled over. They wrote me up. I had, I didn't realize that um, my um, registration had been expired as well. Um, <clears throat> so I went into court. I didn't do what you suggested. I have a hard time, uh, because I'm at home and have the tension in my head constantly. It's hard for me to sit and listen to people, um, or, or interact in a conversation. Um, so I tried studying on my own away from the house with my iPad and, and just nail down in my head the right thing to say, wrote it down, and kind of had a little script. I went into my arraignment and, um, the lady, the commissioner, um, I tried to start off with the, the line of clarification and she was adamant about speaking over me and rushing me through the uh, process. Ultimately, um, submitted a not guilty plea and sent me out the door. Um, I just went to court two days ago, and um, at the beginning of the court, it was myself and three other ladies that was uh, in trial that day. And I look over and there are six sheriffs sitting on the other side. And I didn't recognize the guy that was uh, written me the citation. Um, and I don't believe he was there on time for court. And um, they uh, asked everybody to stand for um, the swearing in. And it was, I was, in my mind, I thought they were swear in individually, you know, for each state. And okay, but, moment, but wait, hold that point. Is, well, hold that point right there. Uh, because I want to get back to the arraignment. You, 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 it sounds like, from what you're saying, is that you, you went into the arraignment and you had not already filed the, uh, demur. No, I did. Why, I did. why not? No, I did. Oh, file that. Oh, file you did? The, I'm the, sorry. The, yeah. So. Yes, I did. Did, typically what we want to do when we start, when they ask about how to play, we want to say, well, there, uh, there's a, there's a demur, uh, you know, a pending. And that the demur has to confirm. And, and, and again, for anyone who, who says, I'm just pulling a, you know, I, 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 it's right in 1001. Prior to a plea, you can demur. You can motion dismiss after that, but you can do demur prior to a plea being entered. So, uh, so if anyone says she that, overruled I, it. Oh, she okay. So she it did come out, and you know, okay. Did you try to plea? Uh, did you say that you intended on pleading, pleading guilty? Yes, I had I had my um, copy of my okay. uh, guilty plea in hand, um, and I was going to go through my list of uh, clarification. Um, she allowed me to uh, get as far as two of them, and um, then she overstepped me, wouldn't let me, wouldn't allow me to continue, and sent me out the door. What What were the two questions that you asked? Um, we were talking about the elements um, of jurisdiction. Oh, the right to. Uh, Excuse me. The right to be informed. Okay. I, I don't have them in front of me right now. 
Okay. We, for you and everyone, what we want to do, when, and when they overrule the motion, we want to object and ask on, you know, uh, is that because the prosecution has sufficient evidence to overcome the demur? If they're not going to engage... Right, here's, the, here's the problem, Mark. The lady who was at the arraignment, who was ultimately the judge at my trial, was acting as prosecutor judge. There was no prosecutor. It was just her. Well, because you were at an arraignment. Well, and at the trial, it was just her. Okay. Um, was the police officer there? Yes. Okay, so the, the, what and happens in these lower level traffic offenses? See, yes. if you have a felony, or you have a very serious misdemeanor, the prosecutor will almost always be there for a felony. But they're not always there right. for misdemeanors. So there's nothing unusual about a prosecutor not being there for an arraignment. There's nothing unusual okay. about a low level infraction in California where they don't send the prosecutor. They just let the, the police officer is acting as the prosecutor. So it's not necessarily that that in and of itself is why the, the judge is prosecuting you. The judge is acting as a prosecutor for different, you know, there's, there's actual evidence that shows that the prosecutor, that the judge is prosecuting you. And, uh, we, uh right. we've talked about that many times. So, uh, she would not even entertain uh, the not guilty? Um, she would not. And so she, even yeah. though you said that you intended on pleading guilty, she spoke over you and entered a plea of not guilty for you. Yes. Okay. So we know that the judge is a lying snake uh, because you weren't refusing to plead. So now we're at the mm-hmm. trial and there's six deputies in there, so take us from there. Okay. So they went to swearing in. And the moment there, the bailiff said, please rise. They were swearing in. Everybody rose their hands and I stated a ju- objection. You're trying to draw me into jurisdiction. That's he not said, what's actually right, happening. Right. And he swore in everyone else. So, okay, by having you swear in, they're not necessarily draw, they're under the impression that you're in their jurisdiction just because you're physical in California. That's the end of the discussion okay. on that. But uh you did not swear in, right? No. Good. But which I, I feel like um that's a powerful thing. Um just by the way they responded to it. How so? Now what took place after that was um the bailiff then went back the back office. They came back out, and then they said, um, we're going to uh, hold off on the court proceedings for a little while longer. And it seems to me that had I not done this, then they would have proceeded. And my officer may not have had been there, but they were giving him time to get there. And when he came, he came in a suit and tie. Not even with a uniform. Hey, he's he's earning double time, or at least time and a half. So he's coming. Looking, yeah. You know, he, he, he's trying to give them their money's worth. You know, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary so, about that. But okay. So he's late. He shows so up. They, they went ahead and they went through the other two people that were funding. One lady got hurt because the officer wasn't there, and they called me up. The officer came up, and I realized. That all these cops here are here just to watch me. That officer, he went through, I let, they let him speak first, and then I was allowed to question him. But before wait, I wait, questioned wait, him, wait, 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 I jump in. in. Did you object to him testifying right. at all on grounds that there's no proof he has personal knowledge of the matters he's testifying to? I didn't. Ah, you gotta remember this, because let them dig a hole for themselves. And so what he's testifying to is that two two general things. He's testifying that the laws apply to you because you're in California and that you violated those laws. That's what the so he has that personal knowledge of that and the rules require seven zero two require that the prosecution present proof that they have personal knowledge of that before they're able to testify. So you've got to keep that in mind. We always have to object 
based on Rule 602 or 702 about the witness's personal knowledge. And so, um, that's bad. Did you object during any of his direct uh, examination and statements? You know what, I didn't because he was just, the way I heard it was he was explaining everything that went down the way that it went down. Okay, um, but, but you got to keep in mind, uh, Michael, that testimony has to be relevant. So what he's saying has to be relevant. And if he hasn't proven, for example, that the laws apply because you're in, you know, that the laws apply because you're in California, then nothing he has to say to you about you violating those laws is relevant. You have to build the, that, that's the whole, see, people who know how to build a case and how to do it properly, you have to build the foundation first. You have to give the foundational information so that you can show the relevance for what the witness is testifying to. Uh, all right, so those th that's bad. You always read, okay, so you want to make sure you're making your objections during the direct. And uh, so now he's on cross-examination. What happened? So now I go ahead. Um, I asked him. Um, well, I, I have to back up this. Um, before I went into questioning the officer, um, I directed my um, statements for clarification again with the judge, commissioner. And I went through my list of clarifications with her. And she responded to each one except the nine to have any idea what I was talking about um, with um, the element of jurisdiction. And I had, uh, I don't recall off the top of my head what the, the last thing was. So I went through that, and at this point, you know, I kept thinking about people talk behind me and the pressure she's trying to put on me, I'm trying to keep my composure. And she just kind of blew off at all of my questions, and I felt like I really dropped the ball here. <laughs> well, uh, I'd have to see a transcript and get more information if it's going to if it rises to the level of a denial of effective cross examination, which is a constitutional error of the first magnitude, and no amount of showing the want of prejudice would cure it. But I need more information to be able to do that. I would certainly appeal. Just from what you told me, we have issues for appeal. But uh, I'm lined up with calls, and I don't have that much time left. So if you need a notice yeah. of appeal and a petition for I'm gonna, eviction relief, this, this I can... Week, this following week, I'm going to uh, sign up your consulting service, and we will discuss this further. Okay, uh, great. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk to you more about this off air. All right, that's Thanks for the call. Uh, Michael in San Diego. we got to remember to object. We, we don't, we, we, we filed the motion of the demur with a, uh, request for discovery. And yes, Brady material is, is required even in misdemeanors. Another new caller. We have area code 727. You're live on the No State Project. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, Mark, this is Niall. How you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, and where are you calling from, Niall? Florida, I left your email today. Right. Long one that you need to call me, so I'm calling you. Okay. What can I do for you? I was wanting to know since I'm not having an issue of having the money for the funds and as the court times on the second of October. But if I buy your twenty five dollars worth of paperwork on the twenty eighth, which I do get paid for, I don't think I'm gonna have enough time to put the paperwork in, am I? You can still argue jurisdiction and argue that well, you can still do that the day of trial because uh, jurisdiction can be raised at any time, even on appeal for the first time. Because subject matter jurisdiction, for one, cannot be waived like uh, personal jurisdiction can. You have to you have to turn the feed off behind you. Go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, so, so, yes, you, you still have, yeah, you can still challenge jurisdiction, of course. But I'm under the impression since of everything I've listened to or watched on your videos that when you do that, they will just automatically deny you because they, you don't give them enough time. So how do you respond to that to them? You're there if at you the trial. Say, if, I will. if they're going to assert jurisdiction, which they've been doing for weeks at this point, it should be in the file. There's nothing for them to prepare for. It has to be in the record 
for the judge to make a determination that there is jurisdiction. So this is how it works. The prosecutor makes the claims and, and is supposed to base their claims on actual proof, not speculation, not circular logic and arguments, you know, but actual proof. It's supposed to be in the file. There is absolutely nothing for the prosecution to prepare for when all you're doing is saying X, Y, Z that's supposed to be in the file is not there. All they have to do is put, it's right here. There's nothing more for them to, and they're at trial. They're supposed to be prepared. This, you're, all you're doing is trying to bring out that the evidence that they're supposed to have from day one is not in the file. And the Brady material is a continuing obligation. They, they're supposed to give you the Brady material, uh, whether you formally ask for it. You have to, they, they're required to give that to you. If they have, if they know that their witness isn't qualified, they're not supposed to put them on the stand. But at the least, they're supposed to tell you that. So if they argue, well, you should have done this before, we didn't have time to prepare, like, do you have evidence to prove this jurisdiction to hold me for trial? And if they say, well, that's a trial issue, well, we're here at trial. They have to give you your discovery, even if it's the day of the trial, which in cases like this, which usually is the day of trial, they have to give you the evidence that they're planning to use against you. So if I cannot turn in that paperwork on the 28th or the 1st, when the court day is the 2nd, so I still have a you, you, option to you have, tell them up front? You can walk right into the court and, and do it there and say, uh, I object to any proceedings because I move to dismiss for lack of evidence proving jurisdiction. Yeah, they could say, well, we're here at trial, and that's what we're trial is for. And you say, well, objection. You're telling me that the prosecution has really hasn't, up until this day, hasn't presented a single fact to support their claim of jurisdiction? Why are we here at trial if they haven't presented it yet? You know, if they're dead set on forcing you to trial, at least you have the opportunity. You file the motion, you can still argue it, but if they're not going to hear that, you still object to their witness being put on the stand because they still haven't presented the proof of personal knowledge. And you still so, Mark, are you, I apologize. Are you stating they're still going to have the police officer, wit, you know, come up and witness and testify? If they're, gonna, if they're going to force you to trial that day, you're know, like, we're here. Screw your motion to dismiss. Take it up on appeal if you lose. Yeah, they're going to put the, they're going to, if, if you ha if it's not dropped and the prosecutor doesn't withdraw, they are going to be held bent on getting that cop on the stand no matter what they have to do. Because that's their, that is their golden thing. That's why you'll get all these jackasses who turn around and, well, you had to go in court. They believe that just the copying on the stand, period. End of discussion. Putting him on the stand is the only thing necessary to satisfy due process. I'm not making that up. Prosecutors but actually that be argue good for me? Well, they will force, they will, they will ignore your objections, and that's why I'm saying that in the worst case scenario, they're gonna put the cop on the stand over your objections. You can object to, uh, to, uh, leading questions and stuff like that. You can object to questions that tend to bring out something that's irrelevant. The judge may or may not, uh, uh, overrule them. He'll probably overrule every one of your objections. And then it's your opportunity to cross examine him. And sometimes this comes down to you annihilating them on cross examination, where they will not allow you to ask the police officer, uh, questions regarding the claims he made at the traffic stop. They, you'll ask him for the facts. They will object that it calls for a legal conclusion. And it doesn't matter that, that your question asks for the facts. The judge will sustain the objection, thereby denying you an effective cross-examination. And that's going to be something you have to take up on appeal. And you have to be able to show, this is the question I asked, asking for the facts. The prosecution objected and said, I was asking for a legal conclusion, and that's not true. And the judge automatically, without any discussion at all, sustained an off-point objection and that and would not allow me to ask for the facts regarding what happened at the stop. That is a, a yeah. textbook denial. Now, I get that. Okay, so it, 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 we're talking about a worst-case scenario, so it, it may go that way. So my question is, even if I keep trying to stop them with that, give me the facts, give me the facts, give me the facts, but what if they keep just saying, well, we thought you stating that such and such, this is what we pulled you over for, it doesn't matter. 
You know what I mean? They're not going to yeah. go to what we're wanting to go to, to the fact, you know, of jurisdiction. Well, you're not just talking about the facts of jurisdiction. You're talking about the facts that led the police officer to determine probable cause. You're talking about all, you're talking about the decisions that, that the police officer made that you violated the law. Okay, so take jurisdiction off the table for just a second. He is testifying that the laws apply to you and you violated them. And the judge won't allow you to ask for the facts he relied on it to make the stop and to support those decisions. That is a textbook denial of cross-examination, no matter what some people say on the internet. That is a, if they're going to do that, you have no chance of, you didn't have a chance in hell of prevailing no matter what you did. But if they're going to openly and notoriously and brazenly deny you effective cross-examination, you had no chance. You have no defense with these people. So your only chance is to get it reversed on appeal. So the keyword is reverse on appeal. Is that something that you mentioned to them at, during the court or that to a clerk at the word? Well, that's going to be something later. You, you can maybe, it, you know, it doesn't make any sense. Look, at that point, you can't dialogue with these people. They are corrupt. They're criminals. That's what reason, I meant. Yeah. Reason doesn't mean anything to them. They're going to deny you a, a, a cross-examination, which the Supreme Court has called the be-all, end-all of a trial, is the cross-examinations. If they're going to deny you that, yeah, and if you can't prevail on appeal, on a denial of cross-examination, you don't even have to show prejudice. It's one of the single worst errors. It's a constitutional error of the first magnitude. If you can't prevail on that, that's just evidence of a rigged system, regardless of what anybody wants to argue on the internet. There's, if they, if they will so brazenly deny you cross-examination and lie saying your question to elicit facts, facts, is asking for an opinion or a legal determination or conclusion, they're lying to you. If they are so desperate to find you guilty that they're willing to openly lie in front of all those people, <laughs> rigged from the beginning. You were guilty when you first walked in. Well, that's just it. I mean, if they know true natural law, but they're practicing otherwise, correct? Say that again. Their game is the so-called... Say again? Well, their their goal is to take money under the guise of uh, of traffic pursuit. All the, everyone, you're all guilty when you walk in the door. Everyone, see, the only log, the, the most logical explanation for why they do those things and do it so consistently across all political boundaries is because you are because the show, the trial is a show. You're already guilty. The judge has guilty. So that's why he will deny every one of your objections, no matter how on point it is. He will sustain an objection from the prosecution, even though it's off point, and you can demonstrate it. Uh, they will turn around and say things that the prosecutor doesn't have to support, you know, doesn't have to prove their claims. Uh, they'll, they'll say that they can put a witness on the stand without um, proof of personal knowledge. But if you and I do that, I have personal experience with this. Other people have. We know that if we try to put this, a witness on the stand and we don't have proof of personal knowledge, we can't turn around and say, but, 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 but people on the internet said we could. They don't give a damn. We don't get to do that. It's all double standards and lies because they made up their mind before. And that's why I said as far back as Adventures in England, the reason why they do that is because they have to get the trial to conform to the decision that was made before the trial, instead of going into it as a fair, independent, impartial decision maker and basing it off of the evidence. Okay, I, but uh, I'm going to try to get one more call in, so I'm going to have to address other questions on uh, on an email. Okay. 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 I do apologize for that. Uh, but uh, yeah, but uh, we've had some email contact. So, and, and if anything, call the uh, call the show on actually call the show on Friday. What time? Uh, it's two to four on Friday. Your time? Yes. Okay, Mike. All right. Thank well, you for your time. No sir. problem. We'll talk to you then. Uh, I'm trying to get one last call. And home bumming it. I'm real sorry. Well, I know you participate in the chats uh, or the uh, the role playing, uh, but we're gonna have to get with you tomorrow. I've got an, uh, another. Um, First caller here, so I just try to get everyone in order. So, uh, welcome to the No State Project. What's your name? Where, where are you calling from? Area code 706. 
Uh, Brandon, I'm calling from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Brandon, what can I do for you today? Well, I was kicked out of the trial on Monday um, for imprudent speeding tickets, so not a real serious charge, but I was trying to experiment a little bit with this one. Um, they entered a plea for me in the arraignment of not guilty while I was trying to question them. Um, railroaded me to the pretrial, then I told them let's go to trial. Um, when I stood up, I stayed behind the bar at first, and I addressed the judge, and I said, you know, I never entered a plea. Um, and he said, well, we, I entered a plea for you. He wasn't the judge that day. I told him, sir, you weren't there that day. And he goes, well, my, you know, we're, we're allowed to enter a plea if you, if you uh, refuse to. And I said, sir, I never refused to. I was trying to understand the nature and cause of the action against me and jurisdiction being applied under the authority of the Sixth Amendment. And, of course, you know, that didn't go over so well. Well, hold on, hold on. Well, well, Brandon, hold on. We'll take a few minutes to to unpack this. Were you in a federal court? No, this is a municipal traffic court. They don't even have a clerk of court there to file motions or demurs, whatever you call them. I don't Uh, know. They want you to file the demurs directly with the prosecuting attorney. I couldn't believe it. Is that something you've heard of before? No, I've never heard where you can file paperwork in a court and not file an original with the clerk. You know, I mean, right. there's got to be someone there so that the judge gets a copy of it. Nope. But the, um, Apparently not. what we want to, one, I don't think you want to use the Sixth Amendment if you're in state court because I don't know, it's kind of sketchy on the applicability of the Sixth Amendment to a federal, to a state court. Fifth Amendment, yes, but because of the, 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 the 14th. But, um, We don't want to go in, or I don't want to go in, and I don't recommend going in and saying I want to understand the nature and cause of the charges and proceed. Now, we may have done that at one point, but history has shown that that's not the best way to go. We want to file the motion to dismiss and discuss and and get a decision on that. If they're not going to make a legitimate decision based on the record, when they decide whether the motion is denied or, or okay, they just deny it without any indication of, of the, the in, you know, reference to the record. Then we go into, I, I intend on pleading guilty. Has the prosecution, is there sufficient facts to support the claim that there's jurisdiction over you? So we want to move right mm-hmm. to that. Uh, the judge, again, the judge has to base, according to due process and fairness, has to base his decision on jurisdiction on the record before him. What in the record proves that there's jurisdiction? And so that, and we go into that. So this way, if they turn around and enter a plea for you, you're able to go back later and say, no, the previous judge lied. I never intended, I never refused to plead. He's lying. That right. did not happen. Okay. And yes, and I, I heard that on the call before too, so I did get a little more information from that when I heard, um, that so I never you know, I never filed any motions or anything. No. Um so so then I I said, Yeah, I'd like to I was wanting to get this cop on the stand because I remember hearing one of your other things where you asked him, you know, did you file a valid cause of action against me and then what are the elements of a valid cause of action? Does that not work anymore either or what? Well, we typically don't want to get into that because we don't have the time. I would rather go right to the throat and assume <laughs> a worst case scenario. Okay. Yeah. Uh and, and there's ways out that they'd like to give the the cops. Uh, so, you know, uh, I've gone through and I've asked, did you file a valid uh, complaint against me? And they allow that. Mm-hmm. Then when you try to ask him questions regarding that, his prior statement, look, if he's not allowed to answer questions whether the complaint is valid, then don't let him answer that it was a valid complaint. Because now it opens mm-hmm. up the door. And, and I'm getting, into, I like to go, and look, when you're doing a cross-examination, compensating credibility, that's, that, that's your meat and potatoes. That's why you're doing a cross-examination. That's the entire point. Compensating credibility. And if he's filing legal documents and starting all this, he filed it. Is he qualified and competent to do that? Is he competent and credible? How does he know? So if he's testified that he filed a valid complaint against you, then, oh, so, do, so you're telling me that, uh, oh, uh if, if, if my next question could be, and the way I used to do this is, oh, so, uh, uh, uh like what you had mentioned, so, uh, you filed a valid cause of action against me that, you know, and, and the court has jurisdiction. Mm-hmm. Why would he have filed it if he didn't believe that he filed a valid cause of action against you? Because now it comes into his credibility and confidence. Why did he file, 
well, would you have you did you file an, an invalid complaint against me? Would you do that? Oh well, no, it's valid. But any questions regarding why he testified that it's valid, uh, it, you know, you'll start triggering all the lawyers. So you can't. Then don't let him answer that. But to me, it goes to his confidence and credibility because he filed. He will. They'll say to you. This is what they'll say to you. You can only ask him questions about what happened on the traffic stop, right? Don't they scream uh -huh. that at the top of their lungs? Did he write the traffic ticket at the traffic stop? I guess so. Uh, I well, yeah. Of course he did. So all this yeah. screaming, you can only ask him about what happened at the stop. Then what he what went into the traffic ticket is gained on cross examination. Now, if there are lawyers out there to say, "Gee, that that no, I would." I, I don't care. I look at, is it logical and is it fair not to allow me to do that? So if they're going to get apoplectic, to borrow the phrase, and say you can only ask him questions about the stop, did you write this ticket at the stop? Yeah. Do you believe it's a valid complaint against me? Yes. Really. So, you see, that's why I said to the previous caller, Everything is done, mm -hmm. Your the decision for guilt is done in advance, which is why you oh, don't yeah. get to answer questions like that. The beauty of this charge, real quick, Mark, is that it's an imprudent speeding. They never clocked me with a radar gun. So I'm assuming this guy made, and the way I was going to pre present it, is that he made a legal determination um, that I was speeding. I mean, he, he had no proof of me speeding by, by way of laser or, you know, radar detector or anything like that. So... That, I was gonna, does there any way, uh, strategy can maybe tell me about how to attack that? Because, I mean, he just basically, in his own mind, you know, said I was speeding. There's no proof of it. Well, what's important is not, what's important is that he's making a legal claim against you. He's taking mm -hmm. a set of facts and applying the law. He's making a legal determination. He is saying you violated a statute. He's saying that the laws mm -hmm. apply because you are in Wisconsin, and you violated it. That's a legal determination or a legal opinion. And mm -hmm. I would rather focus on that. Now, you can get into the merits on how he determined what facts, you know, so, but now you're going to open up the door for him to actually give you your speed, which the judge can then use to convict you. He didn't have, because he never clocked clock me with a radar gun. He saw me go around somebody else on a passing you know, rate, speed, and I guess, you know, do that. But, wait, um, wait, 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 but, 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 Brandon, what, what the cops can do is testify. This is very important. Now, they don't always do this on direct, but the ones who are prepared do. They will give you, they will testify to their training in the academy about okay. yeah. how they were scored judging the speed of vehicles. So based on his okay. training, Seeing the the one car go a certain speed and you passing them, he's able to. Yeah. So the last thing we want to do is have on cross examination have them testify to something the judge can actually use to convict you. Okay. Sure. Very yeah. important rule of cross examination is you don't want him to repeat what was on direct. You just okay. want to punch a hole in what was on direct and use his prior statements okay. against him. So I, I don't. So to conclude. They kicked me out of the courtroom. Uh, I did pass through the bar. I said, okay, I'll, 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 I'll approach under threat, duress, and coercion. He didn't want to list here that. I said, I'll pass your maritime admiralty jurisdiction. No. I came through the bar. Oh, you're killing me, Brandon. I'm sorry. I just kept, you know. Did you, you said this I hate in these guys. Uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty sorry. short on time. So let, look, you know what? Uh, give me, a, I just want to wrap this up for a few minutes, but I do want to say, give us a call on the, fr on Friday between two and four Pacific time and we can continue this. I, I do want, okay. you know, and I apologize to those who are on hold. So, uh, I do appreciate the call. It's Brandon in Wisconsin. Uh, one of the things that we absolutely have to stop doing is it's not going to help. Man, if if the game is rigged, if the game is rigged against you because they determined you guilty in advance, which is why they say such stupid things that you can't ask the cop for the facts his opinions are based on, okay? If they're not, okay. Using these stupid things, admiralty and whatnot, look, you can prove, that you, let's go based on logic and sound arguments and evidence. You can prove beyond any doubt whatsoever that 
all of these court proceedings are under threat, duress, and coercion. So that is absolutely 100% accurate, and anybody who says something to the contrary is wrong. Okay? Wrong. Because they will issue a warrant for your arrest. You have to appear. In California, you get a failure to appear. There, so saying that's fine. We've already done it in the motion to dismiss. We are not appearing. We are participating on a threat to arrest and coercion. Okay? So, uh, keep that in mind. When you're going in there, don't spout this admiralty stuff because what they're going to do, not only will it not help you, it's going to work dead against you because they're going to label you a sovereign citizen nut job and that you are a domestic terrorist. It is not an admiralty jurisdiction. Drop this Jordan Maxwell crap. The word history is not an English word, for example. It doesn't literally mean and come from his story. I believe the etymology of the word is 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 uh, medieval French. It is not taking two English words and putting it together. The man does not know etymology to save his life. It is not admiralty. It is not maritime. So please stop that. Don't do that. And if, and if you're working with me on the, you should on no circumstances be doing this. Oh my gosh. And and real quick before I go, I laid out my reasons why it's a good game. You're forced on a threat to re, a threat to rest and coercion to appear there. The judge is is taking as irrefutably true. The prosecution's claim that the, that a written instrument applies to you just because you're physically in Arizona. I lay out my evidence, and if someone has a problem with the actual evidence and the argument, present it. You get tired of all this. Anyway. Yes, it, it, Tom, absolutely. It's the gun. It's the gun. Rigged game. It's rigged even if it's thrown out. The only reason why it gets thrown out is because they can't make it, some of them have some sense of, uh, of fairness, uh, of trying to make it look good. And you can't make it look good if you ask, well, Mr. Police Officer, what facts did you rely on when you sit, when you determined X? You can't make that look good if you don't allow someone to cross-examine the police officer. It's still rigged. I, it's rigged whether you win or not. It, it, it's just the difference is, Again, some some of the judges have a sense of fair play and and, and realize it doesn't look good, so it gets thrown in. Anyway, uh, I will be live on uh, Friday from two to four, but we are also doing the role playing tomorrow. But if you're subbed, you'll get the you'll get a, a, an alert that we're going live. So whoever I miss today, I get there on uh, on Friday. But um, Again, that's two to four Pacific Standard Time, and uh, we'll uh, we'll get two hours commercial free because I will not be live for the Saturday broadcast. That would be all new and free. Uh, again, this is uh, Mark Stevens coming live from the Fortified Compound in Mesa, Arizona, for the commercial free edition of the No State Project, episode eighty-one. And until tomorrow, next time, salud.